Welcome to Caregiver Cast with Mary Elaine Petrucci. Are you overwhelmed raising a family, working full time, caring for a parent or grandparent? It can be challenging when you're doing it alone. Caregiver Cast helps busy, burned out professionals reduce their stress and overwhelm to create a better caregiving experience for themselves and their loved one. Caregiver Cast brings caregivers together with experts who provide information in a variety of areas. In each episode, you'll get tips on topics such as finance, legal, medical, self care, community resources, mindset, and more. We're here to make your caregiving journey a more rewarding one. Acquire the confidence and skills to be a more capable caregiver by implementing the resources and strategies from these expert thought leaders. Get a community of support, resources, and strategies for your caregiving journey inside the Caregiver Lifeline community. Visit caregiverlifelinecommunity.com. And now here's your host, Mary Elaine Petrucci. Welcome to Caregiver Cast. My name is Mary Elaine Petrucci, your host. My guest today is Lillian Brumit, and she will be talking about the weight of repeatedly grieving. And it's just totally amazing what she has to share. And before I formally introduce Lillian, I'm just going to give you some background information about her. So in her 32 years together with her husband, they've ex- experienced the exhaustion of caregiving and the grief of losing parents, step-parents, beloved fur kids, and numerous friends. Together, they faced it all, and today they live in their dream location, living a life filled with purpose and passion. And before they got to that um, life of living with passion and purpose, Lillian was a caregiver for her chronically ill mother and stepfather before their suicide in 2009. Her husband and herself began caring for his late father by 2008 and through to his passing in 2016. She's been on podcasts before speaking about the weight on caregivers, the constant grief and impending doom with the ringing of the phone as it nears the end. She has spoken in the media about bonding with the dying and helping them share their story. Welcome to Caregiver Castle, Lillian. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you for having me on your show. Most definitely. Um, First of all, I just want to say I'm sorry to hear about your friend who is finding out that he has three different types of cancer and and no one knows how long he will be here um which must make it very frustrating and i can sense all the grief that you're going through right now so um if you need to stop just please let me know So what started you on this road of caregiving and what kind of weight did that have on you and your husband? Uh, When I was very young, um, my mother, my mother had some issues, some mental issues. And so she was playing the sick card to manipulate her kids quite a bit oh you're making me sick oh you're giving me headaches oh look what you've done now I'm down for the count for a few days um you're not doing your chores oh how could you do that you poor sick mother there was this card that she played all the time and she wasn't really sick then but so when she did become chronically ill Mm -hmm. um when I was about 13 I think she was I think around that age I think she was honestly falling into her her illness which was relating from uh kidney disease and a hole Mm. in her heart and so um it um was was taking its toll then and really showing itself and at that point she had been getting some going to specialists and getting some diagnosis before that it was a card she was playing a manipulative card so when she became ill her manipulative card became real And Mm. that part became so difficult for me emotionally as a child, because part of me was thinking, you know, 
don't play with my emotions and also is this real and then the guilt of well but if it's real and I'm not responding the way I should you know and I was a child I had been put in I've been given a job which Dr. Phil tells everyone don't give a child a job ever but I was given the job I was her confidant I was her best friend I was there for her mm -hmm. in between her marriages I was the one who cleaned the house and made the meals and tended to the garden and went to school and I worked a part-time job and I took care of her when she was sick I was the one who you know got her off the floor and took her to the hospitals and it was hard as a child mm -hmm. to go through that and then I think when as I grew up with that sort of weight and also the emotional I guess damage from previous you know false falsehoods um it it really took an emotional toll on me in my 20s my mom got married again to the love of her life a really good man it was her fourth fourth marriage a really good man um unfortunately he also had problems his spine had been broken a couple of times and he it was starting to fuse and he was having all, a lot of issues. So they aged together in bliss on their property, on their farm. I helped them on the farm as I could while I was running my business after work on weekends, Dave pitched into, we, whenever they needed us, whenever mom was in the hospital, whatever, we were there um, visiting and doing what we could. Eventually though, in our thirties, late thirties, mid thirties, something like that, we ended up moving to a smaller community. We moved out of the city to a smaller community. So it was about three hour drive one way from them. So we started caregiving long distance. Every time the phone rang off, we went, come back again. So it was a lot of travel and a lot of weight in that regard. Mm. Um, then when, uh, when it came closer to the time when they were deciding that they wanted to uh, plan their own exit out of life, um, that part was really, really difficult for me because I knew that they were talking about it. I knew that they were trying to prepare me for it. And yet it always seemed like something, yeah, but it's not going to happen now. It's, it's way, way in the future. And so it was always, it always had that sort of feeling for me. But in the meantime, it's that haunting in the back of your mind. Is this the time? Is this the call? Is she going to do it now? All of that. And so mm -hmm. But in 2009, they made the decision. And so Dave and I got the call. We went, um, we went there and dealt with the immediate, you know, police and everything else that you deal with. And luckily my parents were forethought enough that they had everything planned out for me. All, I had power of attorney. My name was on the property. My name was on their accounts. Mm -hmm. um, everything so that when this happened, I was able to just walk in as a like a second owner, a partner of everything, the last man standing, you know, the one who inherited everything in a, on paper. And then I followed through with the estate planning that they had their will, you know, who it went to and all of that. And so that took a few years to go through all of that. And then right after that, Dave's dad moved across the street from us and I was caregiving for him. We were caregiving for him. Dave was working full time at the time. So, you know, I was doing a lot of the, you know, bringing him over, having him over during the day for tea and coffees, and getting him involved with groups and activities and making sure he had food in the fridge and sending him home with packages of foods and meals and having them over here on Saturdays. And Dave and his dad had some like issues. They didn't, they weren't like well bonded. And so um, Dave was a bit resistant to some of the gatherings that we had, but in the end, he was really grateful for the time that he spent with his dad. Sometimes it was a struggle for me to get him to be interested in, in spending time with his dad, but it did, it did end up being a really good mm -hmm. thing. And they ended up having really wonderful adventures and times together and great memories. Um, he unfortunately ended up passing from throat cancer it was a terrible passing, um, very haunting for me. Um, his wishes that he could pass and, you know, wondering why he's, you know, hanging on. He, did, he wanted to go and it was, it was difficult. He couldn't eat, you know, at the end. And that was, I think, mm -hmm. his only pleasure towards the end was food. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so um, when that was taken away from him, that was really hard for him. And it, I think that his, because his passing was so long and grueling, and difficult for him and painful, um, it took a real emotional toll on us. And that was the part of the grieving where I 
I changed, my grieving process changed from so many different levels of grieving and, and emotions that I had over the years. But I guess, I don't know if it was the exhaustion of being a caregiver or just exhaustion from multiple grieving, or if it was just the way he passed and how traumatic mm -hmm. it was for me to witness. Um, I, I actually got really angry. Everything was upsetting me. I was just a walking time bomb. You know, I would mm -hmm. yell at the fork that dropped on the floor. I was just, I was ready to go at everything. I was really, really angry for quite some time. And it took me some, some while to, to let that go. Um, mm -hmm. and, and to sort of ease into the recovery process. Cause now all the parents are gone. There's, there's nobody left. I have like an aunt left. Dave's got a couple of aunt and uncles left and that's pretty much about it now. So I guess the, the big, uh, stint of what was it? A few decades of dealing with deaths and grieving and estate plannings and lawyers, hospitals to have that gone. It took a while for me to like, okay, well, who, who am I now? And mm -hmm. I felt like it was, it was a really strange feeling. And it felt like this big weight had been lifted off my shoulders. And all of a sudden I sprouted this pair of wings on my shoulders, little tiny stubby wings on my shoulders. That was mm -hmm. like freedom in life kind of sense, the sense of, okay, now I can, I can do, I can do something else. I don't have to think about someone else. I don't have to care for someone else in re in that way and so it opened up these wings and and so we moved to a community where we've always wanted to go to we wanted to wait till we retired but as we saw from our parents you don't always get to um you don't always get to experience your good your old age in a good way or for mm -hmm. very long and so we were like right now is our golden day and so we learned that lesson from them and we dropped mm -hmm. everything we sold everything we moved here didn't have a job here yet whatever we just came here bought our house with our you know sales that we had from our other house and what have you bought a house it was a fixer upper <laughs> so it took a lot of energy and finances over the last 11 years turning it into what it is now and just growing into who we are, you know, enjoying life and enjoying the flowers and taking the time to, to be on the deck and not, and not have this weight. And it is such an incredible feeling to have that since, I guess, 2016 when Dave's dad passed, maybe a couple of years after that, after all the estate and most of the worst of the grieving was over, then we were able to like, oh, okay, you know, we're, we're in that stage now, you know, where we're just, oh, okay, we're, whew, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was heavy for a really long time. Wow. Um, that is truly remarkable. I don't know how you went from one caregiving experience to another so quickly. Um, so at some point, when did you start, I guess, um, feeling responsible for caring for like your mother and your stepfather? I mean, you obviously did that very early on. Um, how did that affect you to go from one to being responsible from an early age to like caregiving and then you know, from one experience to another, how, how did that feel for you? There were times when honestly, and, and it's hard to say this because it, you don't want to show the dark side of yourself, but honestly, ripping open my chest here, there were days when I had resentment, deep, dark resentment, mm -hmm. where I just, I just wanted to be free. I just wanted to live my life, man. I wanted to have some happiness. Is there like happiness out there? You know, it was, uh, some some days of anger, deep anger. There were days of heavy self criticism during and sometimes after their passings, where I would look back and say, "Geez, you know, I really wish I wasn't temperamental that day. I really wish I was at my hundred percent and not at my three percent that day. Um, I really wish I was there for them when they wanted me to do this particular thing." And now that echoes in my mind, you know, things like that. One thing, for instance, one thing that really echoes in my mind is my stepdad's dog. When um, he was planning, when they were planning this, they wanted me to take their dog. And I had 
two large dogs at the time. And one of my dogs that I had, they were all rescues. And one of my dogs was a, was only adopted to us because the shelter knew that we knew how to handle him. He was very aggressive and he had been, he had actually been um, tied up in the backyard of a, of a drunkard's yard. And so the only mm. uh, attention he got was like being beaten or things thrown at him. And so he wasn't treated well. And so he had these real issues. And so for me, trying to take care of Onyx was my priority and to, to try to heal him, I guess, was kind of like trying to heal myself in a way. It was a weird mm -hmm. connection I had with him. And so my priority was him. And I had this other dog as well, very high energy Husky, uh, Siberian Husky um, mix. And so I wanted, I, I felt like I couldn't take on another dog and it wasn't the expense because, you know, there's the inheritance and whatever, but I just felt like time-wise and physically and just taking on a third dog, of a large size of high energy that with onyx being so reactive i just didn't see myself taking that on mm -hmm. and i know that i disappointed him i saw it on his face his pain his hurt his concern for his dog it, it was his best friend and he was basically um pleading almost you know the way that he came across please take my dog and i had to refuse him and that you know here it is 2009 in their passing that's still something that echoes in my head that you know i just want to the bad section of my mind wants to beat myself up about you know that i you know why mm -hmm. couldn't i have done that maybe i should have could have there's there's times like that when you look back that even though your mind you can tell yourself let that go come on really let that mm -hmm. go you're human but inside your heart you know the dark part of yourself that wants to tear at you for some reason mm -hmm. um that voice is there and those moments are there and i know that all caregivers go through this but i don't think we talk about it very much you know that we have this mm -hmm. voice inside ourselves sure we tell ourselves oh you know we're only human relax it's okay to not be your best every single day it's okay to have been in a bad mood that day whatever it is that's echoing in your mind but but honestly that's not what the darkness tells us <laughs> it doesn't tell us that at all so no um that's a very good point and you can only do um what you can with i mean if you haven't filled up your cup so to speak you're not able to even do anything for yourself let alone someone else that you're caring for so you're right i know it's one thing to say don't beat yourself up because you weren't pleasant on a specific day however mm -hmm. you really worked your best yeah that you could at that particular time and you know, with your stepdad's dog, I mean, if that was something that you couldn't handle, um, then that's all right. It's all right. right to say no. I mean, you have to set boundaries at some point so that you're not being so exhausted. But obviously, how did you go through, I guess, the burnout slash grief when you were hearing about them contemplating suicide? I felt, I felt, uh, okay, if you could visualize um, a plane of, of glass um, and picture it as if it was shattered, fractured all the way through, but, and all these cracks were showing, but it hadn't actually crumbled. But you could see that if the slightest breeze or you felt like if you tried to clean it or touch it, it was gonna fall apart and shatter, that mm. was me. That was how I felt. I felt wow. like this shattered individual that was just ready to just crumble and into, I don't know what I was gonna crumble into, but I just, I had, I had no strength left. I had nothing holding myself mm. together at that point. Yeah. Wow. That is such a vivid description. Thank you. Yeah. If you, you're just barely hanging on there and. Yes. And the thing that was really hard for me then 
was for me, poetry or writing um, has always been my go-to. You know, I'll pick up a pen and I'll just purge all my blah, you know, I'll just purge it all on the page. And it's not for publication. It's not for anything. It's just for me as a healing tool. Um, poetry as well has always been there for me. Mm -hmm. But when I was going through that particular thing, it wasn't there for me. And I found that um, almost in a sense of desolation, of desperation, of of panic that that wasn't there for me mm. it just wouldn't come out and so it took a, a long time before I was able to write about about um, any of that I have actually a couple of poems in our rhythm and rhyme book about that um, about dealing with their passing and in one of them here um, I talk about uh, it's called graying and in that part I talk about you know being angered by the loss of that tool for me to to deal with that. So um, yeah, so losing that was shocking to me. It's always been there for me, you know, throughout all my, you know, disruptive childhood, all the way through my, you know, uh, tumultuous teens and, you know, growing into an adult and be, all of that, it's always been there for me. And to, mm. to just poof, to not have it anymore. That was quite the journey. That was quite the experience for me. It was something I'd never had before. Wow. So if you didn't have the outlet to write poems, mm. how did you deal with that then? How did you deal with all of that um, sadness, that hurt, that weight of grieving before and after? How did you do I that? worked. I worked a lot. I kept busy, really, really busy, um, 12, 13 hour days. Um, when we moved to this house, it was it was a fixer upper and still kind of is in some ways. We still have mm -hmm. to we need carpet in our living room. We need to upgrade the kitchen, but most of it is done. You know, the siding, the insulation, the roofing, the repairs, the everything. You know, the landscaping. It's all done now. So uh, eleven years later, but that was eleven years of hands on labor. You know, building the fence, everything, everything getting done and um, most of it done hands-on labor, hardly any of it outsourced. So I kept really busy with that, uh, running our business, writing the books, um, managing the blogs, uh, taking on new projects. Like we just took up a, a YouTube channel um, earlier this year. And a couple of years ago, we started Dave's Drum, Drum It with Brum It blog and just keeping really busy, I guess, just, uh, um, for me, the physicality of doing a chore, uh, hard chores, even though, you know, I've, I've got some slight disabled stuff from a car accident in the past, um, doing that work and exhausting myself and feeling the physical pain was a way of me purging it out. It, um, you know, mm. digging in the garden and turning the compost or staining the fence or whatever I was doing and my shoulders are aching and I'm in pain, but for some reason, that's what I need it. Mm. So you were transferring the pain out then? Yes, when physically. You were all those physical activities. Yeah, yeah. And I talked to the walls sometimes when I thought no one was hearing. Yeah, I had conversations with the walls. You know, you might want to say I was praying. You might want to say I was talking to the universe, but I had conversations with the walls, raw conversations. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> because I didn't want anyone else to hear. You know, they just some, for some reason needed to be communicated verbally. And so I would just, you know, when I had too much and I couldn't write it and I couldn't find something else, sometimes just talking to the walls was helpful. Mm. That's uh, totally amazing. Um, so were you, I mean, if this is getting too personal, just let me okay. know. Um, were you shocked at the point that your mother and stepfather actually did commit suicide? Yes, yeah, yes, very, yes. Um, you know, they had, they had just sold their farm and they were staying in a hotel. And as far as I knew, they were looking at properties. They even looked at some properties in the community that we were living in so they could be closer to us, smaller property. You know, they still wanted to have some land for some weird reason. We were trying to keep them, get them to get 
you know, a place without property, but anyway, um, they were looking around and daydreaming about what they were going to do. And so I was thinking that it wouldn't quite be just yet, even though mom talked about it all the time, but she talked about it even when I was young, you know, she talked about that she didn't want to go on and stuff. So I, she's always been a little bit that way. Um, and so I didn't know how serious to take it. Um, the thing with my mom though, is because she was a little bit manipulative. Um, she told me not to tell anyone as far as my two brothers. So it was something I had to keep to myself, big old secret. And then after her passing, I find out that she told each one of them the same thing. Don't tell your siblings, don't tell your siblings. And so everybody's keeping a secret and nobody had each other to lean on during that time, which was, um, I felt very oh unfortunate. Oh. I, I was, I, I was angry about some things at the end. Um, yeah, so we got the phone call and, and my car uh, door all of a sudden wouldn't shut. It was, it, was a, it, it was a leased car. So, you know, it wasn't an old car. And so we couldn't get the door shut. So we had to go to a mechanic, wake the, wake the mechanic up and have him come fix the door so we could, so we could drive uh, to the community and go deal with everything. Um, and then it was just the big rigmarole. I mean, we're dealing with the police who were doing so, so nicely. They had these bags of their belongings there um, that were found in the hotel. And, and I was afraid to open them because I was afraid, like, are they tainted? You know, is there something on them? Because the way they chose was um, gun. And so I was afraid something was on it and I didn't want to see it. So uh, Dave's, or uh, sorry, my, my step, dad's brother was there and so he took on that project of going through the stuff because I I was too afraid to and um, made sure it was okay before I saw it which was really really kind of them to do that um, and the police let him do that even though the stuff was supposed to come to me and we had uh, to sit there with the police and one of the things that I did like within a couple of days of dealing with the police in Kelowna BC um, I sent them like message, I think it was probably an email um, where I thanked them for their compassion. At the time I was just stunned and, mm. you know, shaking and uh, felt like mm, there was like this half soundproof proof room on the outside of myself. Mm -hmm. And I was hearing what they were saying, but I wasn't really like getting it, you know? Right. And then, so they were so kind and so compassionate with me and with doing all the paperwork and helping me and helping Dave help me and the same thing with the funeral home. And so I, I contacted them within days after that and expressed how much that meant to me to be cared so compassionately cared for at a time when I was at my most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're amazing people, people in uniform. I know that there's, you know, bad apples out there in every industry and in every walk and every race, but you know, over all the people in uniform, the first responders, they have so much on their shoulders. They see such horrible things. They deal with incredible stresses. And for them to give the compassion and, and the time and the tenderness like they showed me was, I felt quite um, impressive and I'll never forget that. Mm. I'm glad that they, there was somebody there yes to help you um go through a very shocking experience so i'm glad that you had that support i had really good support actually um dave's uh dave's dad was very supportive um in regards to watching our pets while we were away um when we got there um my brother my oldest brother and his wife helped arrange the um, like the gathering, the reception sort of thing that we had. We rented out this side part of this restaurant and everybody gathered there and had pictures and stuff. And so uh, Al's, my stepdad's sister got a bunch of pictures up and 
put out some things for people to read and look at while they were walking around and, and talking with one another. His brother, I gave him the job of going through their address books and inviting everyone from their address books to the gathering that could make it. Um, so, you know, being able to delegate, I guess I was used to being able to do that. Um, so mm -hmm. I was, I just said, like, the people said, could I help? And I said, yes, can you do this? Yes, can you do that? And I think I was able to accept the help, but also able to delegate certain activities that were just going to be so much, you know, sitting on the phone, calling everyone, having to talk, hearing all of their, you know, their attempts at consolidating and consoling you and all of that. I just, uh, I couldn't face that. So being able to have someone else do that, you know, have someone else book the room, have, and so it was really, really helpful for me um, because I was still, you know, I had to deal with their estate. I had to deal with, you know, the funeral home. I had to deal with their, their cremation. I had to deal with everything else, um, all of their estate and will planning and lawyers and all of that. Um, and so, and the realtor, because they had literally just sold their home like a couple of days before that. So um, there was a lot to deal with and to be able to just, a bit, it was so helpful for me to have them do that. And then at the end of everything, some of the members of the families, uh, my oldest brother, my late, or my ex uh, sister-in-law, she's like, they're divorced. I don't know what that makes her now. But anyway, my ex sister-in-law and a few other people came back to our home. Um, my aunt, my mom's sister came all the way up from the States to be with here. And they were all very supportive and hung out for a couple of days and then they left. And we just, um, we were able to kind of process and deal with it after that. But to have their support there for those days was, was so much more than I expected. You know, we come from a broken home. My brothers were both on their own when they were 16. I was on my own when I was 14. Like we did not have a really close knit family where everybody knew everybody and was helping everybody that just wasn't there. And for them all to come together like that was just so powerful. Mm -hmm. And I think that event also brought, kept us together. Like we're more in contact than we ever have been. Um, even though I guess we sort of, it's been a while now that I talk about it. I think I should probably write or call some of them because <laughs> it's been a while, but um, it, we were a lot more closer and a lot more connected since then. And mm. so it created a bond with us and something that I'll always treasure. Uh, well, that's um, really amazing to me that like you had mentioned that you come from a broken home and been independent at a very early age, mm. um, it's, I think it's just an amazing thing that your family could pull together like they did um, yes. at a very traumatic time in everybody's life at that point. And it's good that you were surrounded um, by family and you could delegate um, because you knew what you could handle. And I think other caregivers should take that into um, consideration, I guess, that um, even though you were expecting a possible suicide and then actually having it happen and um, going through that um, process and taking care of like the estate and everything, um, I, I give you a lot of credit because that oh, you. wouldn't be easy. And I don't know mm -hmm. if I could even delegate in that situation. Um, it's not easy for caregivers to do, even with, you know, the living, the, when you have a living person that you're caregiving for. And also when you're dealing with the estate, it can be difficult because you are admitting that you can't do everything for one um, for another, you feel like you're imposing on other people. Yeah, they say they want to help, but really do they, you know, and do I really want to impose on them and add to their weight? And is that a right thing to do? We're often reluctant to do that, but sometimes we, it's, it's a, a really the healthy thing to do. Um, as a caregiver, we have to be able to take those days off, have someone when, that you can call when you're not 
feeling well, when you have the flu, when you have a headache, when you're not at 100%, to have someone that you can call that can be there for you, that can cover for you, that can give you an hour off at the very least, um, that can be there when you, you know, so you can do grocery shopping or, or so you can tend to the yard work and they sit there and, and read to your, um, to the person that's depending on you. There's, it, it's okay to reach out and get that help. And people really do, they really do want to help. They want to be told what to do and mm -hmm. they don't know what to do. And so by giving them something to do, it helps them process how they're feeling. They feel like they're contributing. They're expressing their love and appreciation for you and the person that needs the help. And mm -hmm. it's just having something to do um, helps them process what they're going through. So it's, it's okay. You're, it's okay to do that. Thank you. That's one thing caregivers don't do enough of. Yeah. Um, so you went from losing your mother and your step uh, father, and then you, at the same time, were caring for your father-in-law. Is that correct? Yes. So you went from one grief process. How did that, I guess, spill over into your father-in-law's care? Yeah, they, it was sort of, they overlapped a little bit. Um, when we moved out of the city, within a few years, Dave's mom was diagnosed with lung cancer and she passed very shortly after, which we're really grateful for that she didn't suffer. She was a walking heart. She was just full of love for everyone and everything, took care of everyone and nurtured everyone, very soft, loving, mothery type of person and um and so we were all very grateful that she didn't have a long suffering um but having it happen so quick it was just like wow she was diagnosed and boom she's gone you know mm -hmm. so that was that was quite the shock Dave was very very close to his mom so he grieved pretty heavily for her he dreamt of her things like that um so that that was something that we went through in while while we're dealing with the guilt of moving out of the city and not being mm -hmm. there 24 seven for my parents anymore. And then uh, soon after that, our, my parents passed. And then uh, I think a year before that, or I think it was a year before that, dad had moved across the street from us. So it, it was just overlap. There was no break in between, uh, in between them. And that, was, that part was really exhausting. So what did you do though? I mean, when you're so exhausted, yes, you can delegate to a certain point, but what did you do for yourself then at that, when you were really overwhelmed and you were still going through this grieving process because it, you went from one to another so quickly, um, how did you help yourself or what helped you well, deal with that exhaustion? Well, uh, actually, my I, I had gotten um, what they call an anxiety disorder that happened from the car accident, PTSD. Um, that was a, a somewhat mild anxiety disorder. Uh, it it escalated, and I still struggle with it. Uh, there was a time when my panic attacks were so bad that it was difficult for me to leave the house. It was difficult for me to be in a lineup. It was difficult for me to be in traffic anything where I was waiting, waiting, having to sit somewhere, congested area, anything like that would set me off. Um, my fear was huge. My fears got uh, very large. Um, my sensitivities became much more upfront. Um, I felt super vulnerable for a very long time. And so I sometimes put up these walls, which kind of came from my child, I think, you know, pretending I was tougher than I was, you know, mm -hmm. oh yeah, you know, I'm pretty tough, but I wasn't, I was like shattered glass underneath. And so what I did for myself, gardening, writing, poetry, meditating, yoga, uh, dogs, <laughs> dogs are my everything. Um, they're, they're definitely my healing tool. Uh, 
at the time I was healthy enough to go for walks and hiking and things like that, light hiking and light, light mountain biking, like along the rail, the railways that have been turned into trails and things like that. I can, obviously I can no longer do that, but at the time I was still physically able to do things like that. So we would do things like that on the weekend, go camping. My idea for camping was just to go somewhere where we could Zen. My husband wanted to go, oh, let's go, you know, throw on the backpack and go hiking. But I was like, no, can we just Zen and look at the fire <laughs> for like three days straight and do nothing? You know, mm -hmm. that's kind of where I was at. I really needed to have my down and my quiet. And I became kind of resentful of my time in regards to I started pushing people away, which was not a healthy thing to do. I realized that I'm a go. That's my go to. I push I push away. I tend to isolate so that I can sort of create a bubble around myself and protect myself in a mm -hmm. way and allow myself to recover so that I have the energy that I can open up myself and bring people in again. So I think I had to go through different stages there. Um, I'm at the point now where I'm starting to open myself up again and I'm able to bring people in and love and experience love and what, what comes with that is also more grief as you were saying, you know, mm -hmm. um, Actually, about five years ago, I lost my best friend. She had lupus and she died of a heart disorder that destroyed me. It literally mm -hmm. destroyed me. Um, she was like my final straw. Um, losing her, that was tough. Mm -hmm. um, and then now I've grown close to these other, this other couple um, who live in our neighborhood and now this is happening. So, but I feel, I feel stronger to be able to handle it. Um, mm -hmm. But I find with each time that there's a new death, a new grief that comes along or an impending grief that comes along, echoes of the past come up, echoes of the old thoughts or the old feelings of the old uh, grief will come up. I'll, re I'll recall grief from different situations. Mm -hmm. And um, that too is starting to get less. You know, before it was just one on top of the other and it would just pile up. Now it's sort of like I recall them and it comes up and I deal with it and it's okay. It's not, it's not um, something that feels like it's going to drown me. Mm. Or shatter that glass that you weren't mentioning. Oh my gosh, that's yes. so powerful. Um, so how... And you're going through the same process again with your friend's husband right now. Yes. So it took you, what, a few years after your uh, father-in-law passed away to feel like you were sprouting those rings again. So did that, was it that in time frame helpful for you? That six yes. years between or that five years? Yes, it really was. Um, I was able to like process and uh, figure out what my days should be. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, they were so filled with concern with others, you know, or making meals for the next time I see them or something like that. Uh, whereas now that isn't there anymore. I was saying to Dave uh, recently that this, this garden season is a little bit strange because usually I'm making packages of like jars of stew or something and I'm putting them aside for the someone and I don't have to do that anymore and I'm like gosh what am I going to do with all this food now <laughs> you know because <laughs> we have so much right but, yeah exactly. you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah it's it's a little different that's for sure I I um when I was um when I was growing those those wings um it was it was, uh, I don't know, it was, it was a strange feeling. I didn't, I, unfamiliar feeling um, that, okay, now this weight is off my shoulders and this lightness now has come up and it felt awkward. And um, I don't know, it just felt awkward. Yeah. Well, I can understand that in a way my mother took care of her mother and she did my mother did make a comment that it took about a year to um get back to some kind of normalcy because like you say you're always thinking and waiting for that phone call yes 
Yeah. You know, the, the wings actually comes to me, to my mind because I dreamt of them. So I, I literally had this dream. So I was, I was feeling the weight of my mom and Al's passing. And it had been about a few years after that. And I actually had this dream where Al came to me and my mom was in the background. She wasn't really talking, but he came to me and he said to me, it's okay. You don't have to keep grieving. You can let go now. We need to move on, he was saying, and you need to let us go. And then he pointed and he showed me like these green fields and rolling hills. And he said, this is where we are, we're okay. And then right after that, I had another dream. Like it sort of went into another dream. And it was so vivid, like I can see it now. And I heard, I heard this snapping sound, this fluffy snapping sound, like as if laundry on a line. Mm -hmm. And I had this dream that I had grown wings and not like angel wings, but more like wings of freedom in life and I wrote this poem I'm going to quickly read it to you I know you're yes. short on time it's a really short poem it's called wings on a breeze and that's where this poem came from it was my moment where I was able I was still grieving of course but I was able to let the the weight of that grief go it was a huge weight off my shoulders it's called wings on a breeze I dream of feathers ruffled and rippling by the force of the wind sounds like laundry on a line swept by a brisk breeze i'm alive and i lament a life of bitter resentment the terrible need for approval now faded with her death leaves this mind weighted down by thoughts of sacrifice and loss a regret that childhood dared me the strength to support while circumstances struck and struck and struck again taking bits and pieces of her joy, her trust, her strength. And with her soured look on life, I grew into a woman and her friend. She no longer fights the wind to stay afloat and fly to that special castle in the sky. Today she soars without bruised wings, nor battered body to hinder her. While I, now in midlife, I, who never knew wings, have sprouted a pair. So small, so awkward. Will they enable me to fly one day and try my own flight with the wind? Wow. <laughs> it's tough for me to read that one today. <laughs> yes, um, and you did it very well. Oh my Thank God, you. that is so powerful. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing That's that. in one of our books, actually, our Rhythm and Rhyme book. <laughs> okay, well, there we yeah. go. We better yeah. get that up there. Yeah. Um, so can you give us some, like, three takeaways about yes. dealing with grief before and after a person passes? Yeah, you, you got to take care of yourself. Drink a lot of water, take your vitamins, try to get some sleep. It doesn't matter when you sleep, where you sleep, get some sleep. It's so important. Take that quiet time, turn off the TV, turn off the television, take your phone away, sit on the deck, sit in your, in, on, by the park, sit near water, L allow your flat thoughts to flow with the wind and flow with that water be a part of life again, start mm -hmm. a garden, a little wildflower garden, plant some plants on your deck, your step, uh, put a terrace garden on your fence line, whatever it takes to grow something. It helps you feel a part of life, of the life cycle again, to be your hands in the soil, to see the flowers, to watch the butterflies appear because it's something that you have planted. It's, it, it is so healing. I really encourage you to do that. Spend some time with uh, some pets, someone else's pets, uh, volunteer at the pet shelter, wherever you can get involved with other animals, animals that you personally love and connect to is very, very helpful too. Even if you can't own one yourself um, or care for one yourself due to your situation, make just try to get out there and spend time with them. Go to a petting zoo, go to a museum, you know, go to a museum, go to art shows, go to quiet places where you can refill your bucket and have joyful silence as opposed to the suffocating silence. Wow. 
Uh, I don't know. I love that suffocating silence. Wow, it's incredible. Thank you. Thank you for all of your powerful testimony and what you've been through in terms of grief. Um, is there some way that the listener can get in touch with you if they would like some more information and to share their story with you? Um, can you give us some information about how to contact you? Absolutely. First, for all of our listeners today or later on, please feel free to comment on this um, show because I'll be responding and Mary will too to your comments. You can always reach out to me on most social networking sites. Just type in my name, Lillian Brummett, and you'll find me there. Um, you can also just use your favorite search engine of choice. Type in Dave and Lillian Brummett, and you'll see pages and pages of places where you can find us. Our main website is brummettmedia.ca, brummettmedia.ca. Our name is spelled B-R-U-M-M-E-T, brummettmedia.ca is where you can find us. So. Thank you so much, Lillian. Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you Thank so you. much. I want you to say that again. Okay. Um, I couldn't have gone through what I did without the support of my husband, who has been the pillar in my life since we got together some 32, three years ago. Um, he has always been my strength. Um, he, he was someone that I could rely on. He, he drove when I couldn't drive to get places. He was he would help me manage the lawyers and understanding the legal talk. And he was there for everything all along the way. And I was there for him when he was taking care of his father's estate at the best that I could. And, um, but I, I couldn't have done, I don't think I could have gone through what I did if I didn't have my husband 32 years of being the pillar of strength in my life. Wow. I'm glad, so glad that you found somebody that you could rely on and, and trust like you have. I think after going through everything you have, um, it sounds like he's the perfect match for you to give you that support and that strength when you're going through really difficult, challenging times. So yes, I'm quite lucky that I have that strength and our relationship is, is solid and it has always been solid and when we first got together, I didn't trust it. It took a long time for me to trust and be vulnerable enough to be dependent on the relationship and, and to, to uh, be vulnerable. But once, once I accepted it, that this is real, this is really something solid, um, it's, it's brought a lot of joy for me. And look at all the joy you're bringing to other people with your books, your blogs, and other in youtube so thank you again thank for you. Um, being so vulnerable um and f because i don't know how you did it so thank you thank you thank you for listening to the caregiver cast today get a community of support resources and strategies for your caregiving journey inside the caregiver lifeline community visit caregiverlifelinecommunity.com Get involved with the show. Send your email to mpetrusi2002 at gmail.com. And we'll see you again next week for another episode of Caregiver Cast.